Hello everybody, my name is Anne-Marie Reid and I work for Highlands and Islands Enterprise and I currently um, project manage High's involvement in the Capido Interreg North Sea Region Cultural Heritage Project. So thank you very much for joining today's session on virtual tours. And this is the first session in a series of eight workshops. And today's session forms part of a new workshop program, <coughs> excuse me, titled Bringing Museums to the Home. And the workshops are designed to help heritage organisations connect with new and existing audiences through digital media. So the Capito Interreg North Sea Region project has partnered with Expo North Heritage to develop and hold this programme of online workshops. So if I could just provide just a bit of background just about the, the Capito project. So Capido, it stands for Culture Power to Inspire Development in Rural Areas and it's funded through the Interreg North Sea Region project. It has a total of 16 partners from the seven North Sea Region countries, which are Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium and the UK. And the project's overarching aim is about developing new business opportunities in the culture and heritage sector across the North Sea region. And it's through Capido that Highlands and Islands Enterprise has been able to partner with the University of St Andrews to develop a pilot programme of transnational digital heritage projects in Scotland. And just be, before I go on, I would uh, I would also just like to to welcome and thank um, just some of our European partners that have, that have joined today's online session. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> So our PROG programme, it's delivered against three strands. So the first strand of our Capito project is digital adoption, and it involves working with a cohort of cult cultural social enterprises and communities across the Highlands and Islands region. And we're looking at working with them on digital product development and also looking at ways to enhance their online presence. So throughout this programme of workshops, we will be making reference just to, to some of the Capito digital adoption projects that, that we're currently working on. So the second strand of our project is Digital Connect and the University of St Andrews is working on developing digital platforms and interactive maps for the purpose of information exchange amongst our European partners but also as well to help the cultural heritage organisations that we're working with to help grow their online presence and also to help them market their cultural offering. And our third and final strand is the digital skills element. And that's looking at raising awareness of the different technologies that are relevant to the cultural heritage sector. And also looking at the areas of media creation, delivery and dissemination. And it's through this strand that we've been able to draw on the university's sort of knowledge, skills and expertise on digital heritage to develop and facilitate this workshop programme of bringing museums to, to the home. So I'm just going to shortly pass you over just to our colleagues at the university and that's Dr Alan Miller and Catherine Ann Cassidy from the Open Virtuals World Group at the University of St Andrews and they will facilitate today's session on virtual tours and how to make heritage journeys. So virtual tours offer virtual travel in time and space. A virtual traveller can explore historic buildings, dramatic landscapes and discoveries of archaeology without leaving the home. Creating a virtual tour enables the audience to connect with heritage and particularly during the period that we're in and sort of lockdown, it's you know, probably very relevant um, just now. And it also provides a very valuable permanent resource. So today's workshop is going to look at how to make a virtual tour, the different types of virtual tours and how to make a roadmap for each type. 
The format for today's presentation is Dr Miller and Catherine Ann will deliver a presentation on virtual tours and then at the end it will open up for a Q&A session. So I hope you enjoy the session and thank you very much for joining. Thank you. Uh, with that, Alan. <laughs> oh, hello. Sorry, I was I was trying to share my uh, screen. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Caroline, and and thank you for everybody for um, coming to to this webinar. I, as I said, we're going to talk be talking about um, virtual tours, and it's it's going to be a story of two halves. In the first half, um, myself, Alan, and and, and Catherine uh, are going to. Um, do a bit of presentation about how it's possible to create, how it's possible to make virtual tours and a bit about how, how they can be used and how they can be shared. Um, and then um, we're going to have a little bit of a break and then we're going to have a session which is a bit more free form. So there, there will be a lot of room for, for questions or for um, maybe you actually want to contribute some of the experiences that you have of doing these, of doing these things um, and also um, Jackie Aitken from um, Time Spam Museum in Skota um, from the east of Iceland will be here um, to be part and parcel of the, of the panel as well. So I wanted to um, start off by loading up PowerPoint. So I've got that and a, we will just go to virtual tools and the um, um, That's great. And then we'll start the presentation. Um, so <clears throat> virtual tours, how to make uh, uh, heritage journeys is the, the topic and we're going to break this down. I think it, like anything, if you, if you break it down into sections, um, it makes things easier. So we're going to break this down into seven sections. So we're going to look at motivation and history, why we would like to do this sort of thing. Um, then we're going to look a little bit at what is a what is a photosphere. Um, we're going to the virtual tours that we're going to be talking about are going to be focused around the idea of a photosphere of a spherical image. We'll then look at um, goals and objectives. What 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 might be the goals? What might be the objectives that we were attempting to to achieve? Um, and then have a look at the mechanics of how to make a tour mechanics of how to share a tour, look at some other questions and, and talk a little bit about some sources and resources. So moving, um, moving on then, um, so motivation. This is an image of um, part of the museum, Na National Museum of Scotland. Um, and actually the PowerPoint, which will be, will make available um, there, there is a link where if you click on the link, you go through and you can do a virtual tour. And this means that you can go all the way around the museum and you can see um, all of the exhibits. Quite a lot of the exhibits have been also been put into um, galleries. So through this method, um, it's possible for um, anybody who is um, in their home who has access to the internet via a mobile phone or via a um, tablet, they are able to access the uh, imagery and the exhibits that exist um, inside of a inside of a museum. And this is something that has increasingly been used um, since the uh, pandemic, because obviously a lot of us aren't in a situation where we're able to um, visit 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 museums. Um, and then the second example is. Um, that of North US 360. So here we're talking about creating a virtual tour of a landscape, North US 360. It's an exhibition that was done um, a few years ago now using, the, using 360 um, technology so that you could arrive um, in Loch Maddy, go to Ty Cursiva Museum and in Ty Cursiva Museum do a virtual tour of major archaeological sites on the on the island um, using the 360 technology projected onto a big screen, projected onto a wall, but also accessible via a via a mobile phone. And so in that way, it's possible to um, 
have an idea of what was on the island and to, to get an introduction to it, perhaps as a precursor to then going there um, physically or, or perhaps as, as an as a experience in and of its own in and of its own right. And that was a part of a project done by collaboration between Open Virtual Worlds Group led by um, Christopher Davis and Ty Kursova, uh Museum and the Common Ectory um, of uh, North for, for North US. So um, we can achieve a lot with those things. Um, virtual tours seem to be something that is quite <clears throat> quite new, um, but actually the idea of placing somebody in the center of, of a piece of heritage so that they are able to um, be immersed in that heritage is not something that is new. It was a significant and major um, form of entertainment um, and exploration for the Victorians. And in a sense was, um, and, and was pushed out of it, its kind of central entertainment and educational role by the development of film. But it's kind of interesting to think about film because at the same time that film was able to supersede these sort of 360 um, exhibits and, and exhibitions um, because of its cheapness and because of the ability to change um, the presentation um, week by week rather than, uh, rather than year by year. But in that, in that, we were kind of, the audience was kind of expelled from the center of the, from the, center of the experience. Um, and I think what is interesting now is that the technology exists to be able to have moving parts, to be able to change what it is we're looking at on, a rec on, a, on an easy basis, to be able to do multiple virtual tours um, and to be able to be at the center of things. So in a sense, technology enables us to get the best of the sort of film approach and the um, old uh, virtual, experience, virtual experience approach. Um, so moving on then, to look a little bit at what is a photosphere, and I, on one level, it's um, kind of um, kind of obvious. Um, but I think that um, everybody talks about it with respect to um, 360. Myself included, we say 360 tours, 360 cameras, 360 images, 360 videos, 360, 360. To be a pedant. Um, Kind of like 360 degree stuff exists only on a plane so whenever you hear people talking about 360 they're really talking about spheres so that you can look up and down a sphere is something which exists um, in three um, in three dimensions and what is a photosphere well if you imagine yourself in the middle of an inside out globe um, that's essentially what a photosphere is you're sat in the middle um, and you can look and you can look around um, and there's three aspects to it that are of interest projection resolution and meta and metadata so the first thing that's important to understand this is a um, 360 image um, which is presented as a flat projection okay so in this sense it is exactly the same or in in, in a real sense it is exactly the same as any other photograph so when we work with spherical media we're working with the same formats um, that if we were working with flat media so a jpeg or a, a png or a gif these can all be flat or they can be or they can be spherical okay so this is an example of um, it as a, a flat projection um, and this is a portion of the projection um, for a spherical for a spherical projection so this is important to um, understand because it enables us to, for example, um, use any software that is designed to be work with images, you can work with 360 images in, albeit the software might not understand that it's a 360 image, but nonetheless, you, you, can, you, can, um, you can do that. And some of the actual flat images are very striking, um, are very striking as well. So secondly, with regard to resolution, this is important to understand as well, I think, which is that you'll often see the resolution of a 360 image as being quoted as 4K or 8K um, or even higher than that, 16K. And these, these sound 
you know, like really quite, quite impressive numbers. If, if we were going to go out and buy a television or a screen for our computer, you know, an, an 8K screen for a computer would cost thousands of pounds. You know, it's, it's not going to be the, the few hundred pounds that you would get for a 4K computer. So you're talking about um, sounding very impressive. The important thing to understand is when you when they talk when you talk about 8K for a video for a 360 video or spherical video or 4K for a spherical video, it is that's for all of the media. That's for the whole that's for the whole sphere. At any point in time, you're not going to be looking at the whole thing, right? At any point in time, you're going to be looking at a fifth of it, a tenth of it, or twenty of it, depending upon what your view portal is into that so that to give an idea if you want to get high definition resolution of what you're looking at you probably need to have the resolution of your media has been about 13k 13,000 so that's a lot bigger than um any of the screens and any of the um flat media that we'd use this has two implications one implication is that the, the media is going to be bigger than the photographs that you use in the, the normal photographs and, or normal videos is going to require more storage space and a bit more heft to move it around. And the second thing is that, you know, because computers are getting quicker, um, graphics are getting more powerful. Um, Moore's law tells us that um, every year what you can do with a computer, what you can do with the graphics card increases in its capability. And this means that every year, um, you know, into the, into the foreseeable future, we're going to be able to have access to higher resolution 360 images um, and be able to move to the situation like you had in um, Blade Runner, where you can like zoom in on a tiny part of the, a part of the image and uh, get, the de get the detail for it. And so this is, I think, is, is interesting because it means that in terms of the sort of virtual tour, and the technology, although it's been around for a long time, we're really at the beginning of its practical use and we can expect to get a lot more from the technology um, in the future. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's worthwhile investing in it in, in it in the here and now, because we're expecting, you know, it's a train that's going to be moving um, and the, the re results that we get from that are gonna be improving um, over time. Um, so, Moving on then to when we're thinking about um, making a virtual tour, I think that it's important to think about the same sort of things that you would think about if you were doing an exhibit, if you were doing an exhibition, or if you were doing making a film. And so I think that this is helpful because it means that there's a lot of skills that are out there. There are a lot of people who you know, know how to do an exhibit, who understand how to make a film, who can put together a PowerPoint presentation, who can talk to, who can talk to an audience. And I think these sorts of skills transfer very easily into the sort of virtual tour technology, um, technology domain. I think that what, what we're trying to do, and, you know, with this series of seminars and supporting things with it is to just um, try and give a helping hand so that those transferable skills can get moved over. So we need to think about um, goals and objectives. And I think in terms of that, if we're making a virtual tour, you know, we think who is it aimed at? Who are the sort of people? What is, what is the sort of audience that we're uh, aiming, aiming for? And in, in the pandemic, I mean, we've done quite a lot of work with different sorts of virtual tours and different sorts of virtual reality um, from creating uh, installations inside of museums using quite high powered computers with headsets and full immersion and being able to wander around and do interactive stuff, okay? Um, to creating something which is accessible um, to a wide number of people over the internet through using commodities, um, computers and commodity phones that they're likely to have in existence. And also to be able to create um, media that can go into the virtual tour, again, 
using equipment that is accessible in the in the house and and um, already in inside of the museum without having to invest hugely in it. So in that sense, in the context of pandemic and lockdown and possibly coming out of lockdown for a significant period of time, we're, in terms of audience, we're, at, we're putting a focus very much on um, people in their homes, um, where they are, being able to reach out to where they are. What do you want to communicate? Um, that is a, is a question that, you know, you, you will all um, have answers, have, have, have different answers for. But I think it is something that is really worth um, thinking about. Um, how long should the tour take to complete? So sometimes um, it's really not a good idea to do more and more and more stuff. I mean, if you're wanting someone to spend five minutes, 10 minutes or an hour, then that impacts greatly upon the sort of um, design. And then is there a call to action? What sort of a call to action is appropriate? Because a call to action, you know, look at this photograph, please come here, isn't appropriate, you know, at the moment. But a call to action which says, you know, look at this photograph, please remember who we are and what we've got to offer and think about coming to see us at some stage um, in the future, you know, might be appropriate. Or something which says, um, you know, this, this, yeah, so thinking about what we want the audience to do um, as a consequence of um, engaging with the virtual tour, I think is a really um, important um, perspective to have. So those are the um, goals. And what we're going to do now, I think, is I'm going to um, step back and Catherine is going to talk to us about how to, um, how to make a tour. Um, and in order to do that, um, I... You can, you can keep sharing your screen if you want. Oh, okay, If you want to sure. just go ahead through, if that's easier. That's okay. fine. Fine. I'll just tell you when to move on. <laughs> okay. So, hi everybody, I'm Catherine, and um, we'll go the next step. So, building on from what Alan spoke about, of planning and what are your goals, of the tour, we're gonna to actually now talk about the nitty gritty of how to make it and the different ways to do that, uh, different avenues to do that. So some of the things we'll talk about <clears throat> mentioning is, which might be a bit more in depth that you think than going out and just kind of taking a camera and snap, 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 taking a few photos, is continuing, continuing with those thoughts that we had of who's your audience, what is it for, what's the plan, uh, would then be selecting your scenes, you know, thinking about the image that's going, what is the narrative that goes through the whole tour? Is that, does that di dictate where you're going to take an image? Um, you know, so selecting scenes, then layering media within that tour. So hotspots or any kind of interactives that can be placed within that scene. It isn't just have to be a static photo it can be layered to give a much uh, more in-depth experience for someone. Um, okay, so we're going to that. So scene selection. So if you had somebody, you know, whether, and this goes for whether you're inside or you're outside, if let's say you had somebody who gives very good tours of a location, you know, do they march right up to wherever the location is and start their tour or does and start their talk or does it start you know way back down the hill or something before you even get to the site or is it something that you want to start in a gallery or like a, a transitional space to give a little preface just as if you were designing an exhibit as well this is kind of like a, the same kind of thing you would go through and think about that so that also dictates then where you put your camera because your camera is going to be in looking in every direction. So if you think about yourself in the middle, you think, what is what are we having them trying to look at? And trying to make that um, kind of the starting point, you know, wherever your starting point, where you want them to look, you know, think about that, where you should place your camera away from that. Uh, what is the context? So if you want your first thing to be an object and it's right in front of you, maybe don't put the camera right up real, really, really close. Um, it's just like if somebody was walking through. 
thinking about your lighting, because this is all things that you can edit a little bit if you wanted to go further into the post-processing with images, but if you don't want to really, and it's just more of an automatic thing, you think about how you can, you know, oh, is there a bit of a light that's shining off of a, ref and then a reflective surface? Is that gonna all of a sudden blow out my camera? Um, so it's looking at some of those things and thinking very logistically of, oh, okay, maybe if I tweak this or I move this a little bit, that will make my content so much more, so much better and not have, you know, a glare showing where they, and all of a sudden everything's dark and you can't see everything. Next down. Great. So, and I mentioned uh, narratives. So thinking about um, that story that's going through, and this is very much dedicated, our, our, um, depending on the platform you put it on, but certain platforms, which we'll talk about, allow you to add text, add a, like a, a panel before you start your tour. You can add hotspots, which can include text or photos or video or audio uh, to be able to enhance uh, the experience and different kinds of interactions. So if you, let's say, want to do a gallery and there might be multiple ways around the gallery or a site where you can either decide to go this way or that way, your interactions can then be almost portals to jump between the scenes. So it's not just linear. You can have multiple ways to go through the scene. And those, those are all things that you would then plan as much as you can, um, almost storyboarding it if you can. You don't have to in the beginning, but as long as you're thinking about it, um, then that's really important and it makes it planning uh, and shooting it much easier. Excellent. Great. So we're going to talk about equipment and software. So we're going to range from the very simple, what you probably already have at home and probably all, already access uh, easily at home to then something you might need to order, but is quick and mostly automated to then if you really want to have high, high, high resolution and a lot more uh, variability with your processing afterwards. Um, so the first type, the more simple type, you can use your smartphone. And that could be through uh, your Google Street View app. So, and which is a free app provided by Google. You do not have to post it on Google. You can just use it as a way to stitch uh, a Photosphere together. And then you can save it, have it saved into a folder and then use it as you want. Uh, but it's just a good, easy platform. It's very easy. And so I think there's a slide I can't see ahead of me um, about that a little bit more. So, and then, okay, but we need to go back. This might have been an issue. Okay, never mind. So then the second one would be uh, a camera, then, then it's automated, a 360 camera that is pretty much a click. You may be able to adjust some settings, but you put it on a tripod, you walk away, you have a clicker or your phone, and you click, and then pretty much within seconds, it's done and stitched. You can look at it on your phone. You can say, nope, that was bad, delete it, or go ahead and do the next one. You can take multiple shots pretty quickly. Um, and then the last one would be with a, a camera, with a DSLR camera, uh, with a tripod, and with a panoramic head to be able to, to move it around. So, go forward. Great. Great. So, uh, 360 cameras, there are tons of them on the market now. Um, maybe five or six years ago when we were doing this uh, as a kind of newer thing, there was only a handful. So, there's a few. Uh, that companies that have really gone through and, and really great products, but you can, if you're a diehard Samsung fan, there's a Samsung one. If you're a diehard GoPro fan, there's a GoPro one. Um, so, and pretty much what it is, is you have two or more uh, lenses to be able to get the full 360 immediately. Um, the software stitches it yourself. You download an app. Um, you might have some uh, automatic controls and then manual controls that you can fix. And uh, so one of the ones that we end up using a lot is just a Ryko uh, branded Theta, which is just one that we've used and tried and trust, uh, tested for us. Um, so you're looking, and for most of these, you're looking between 200 and 400 pounds. 
um, just knowing your price range ish. Um, you would have to set it up onto a tripod. You don't have to, but then that usually means you have a hand in somebody's head uh, in your photo. So it'd be good to be able to have a tripod and then you use the app as a clicker uh, to be able to then move out of your shot. Uh, another brand is Insta360 is another one that we've used uh, quite a lot, so. Next, please. Thanks. So using your, your mobile phone with an app like Google Street View, um, and this in this photo, um, the student is demonstrating and doing it on a tablet as well, is that you imagine yourself as a tripod and the app st goes step by step through where you should take uh, the photo. And so it kind of, you position your camera and it takes a photo and you kind of follow a dot and it'll go all the way around, all the way up and around. Uh, yep, so here's some photos showing kind of what the interface looks like a little bit uh, to build it. Your photo will, will work if you take the time to do it. It probably takes about I don't know, 45 seconds to maybe a minute to do it appropriately and all the way around. And it usually comes out pretty well. Um, but you have kind of a scale of, you know, yes, this would, this works, maybe it's not the, the best best, but it is something you probably have, you know, in your pocket already that you can go ahead and do, and especially with a free app. Um, yep, so we can go to the next one. Great, so in the highest uh, uh, resolutions and with the most configurable would be having your own camera with then uh, a manual, with manual settings using a tripod, but using a specific panoramic head that is able to move around, be able to get the exact degrees that you need to be able to then get your coverage and overlap. Uh, you need to then stitch the photos together. So you also then can have your manual settings, uh, which most often you would put into an HDR setting to be able to take multiple kind of exposure levels to get the best quality of your photos. And then you would put it in through a program, a software such as Huggin, uh, which then you're able to stitch those photos, collects your images, stitches them together. Uh, you're, able to pro you're able to work through it a bit uh, to kind of process it how you like, uh, as opposed to everything being automated and you don't have any kind of uh, hand in it at all. So, but that does, that would take more learning where on the opposite end of your spectrum with the mobile phone and then to the 360 camera, the learning curve is much lower. So, but then your photo, then the kind of quality photo that you get is what the next photo we had. Helen? Nope. Nope, you had it, it was the library photo. There it is. Could you make, Alan, sorry, could you make the people a little bit smaller on the side as it's showing as a big, big, big black box on the... I'm sorry, okay. It's okay. To be honest, I didn't, I, I thought that was just me. <laughs> I didn't realize that was... No. Nope. Um, you were all seeing that. If you just, at the toggle at the top, making it smaller or something. Okay, well, anyway, here you get a little bit more. This is the flat image of uh, a high resolution. Um, I don't know if it's a, a gigapixel photosphere, but of um, St. James Library in uh, University of St. Andrews. So you can see the quality, you can see the re resolution is quite nice. Um, and that is with taking with a DSLR and a panoramic head. So this one. Do you want me to move on to the next one? Yeah, I kind of went through that. That's all right. Okay. So I think this is where, where I take back, take back over, is that right? I think so, Kathy. if you'd like to. Good. Um, so, so Catherine's kind of done a swap tour of, of how to um, make a tool and how to make um, photographs, but um, I wanted to talk a little bit about how to share a tool. Um, and th this is something that we're going to touch on more later on because we're going to have sessions on um, mapping specifically and creating tools within that context 
um, is, is very is very relevant. Um, but I've got kind of like five ways in which we can go about doing this. So one is is there's this application called RoundMe, which is free up to a point. I mean, it it but it, it's a good way to um, get going and it's a good way to create a tour um, which is then made, uh, which is then accessible. Um, Google Street View um, and Google Maps are great venues for um, photo spheres, spherical media. It enables us to extend the Google Street View from the street into the museum or into the archaeological site. Um, castle or, or whatever it, it happens to be. Um, and this is great because there are a lot of people who use Google Maps all of the time. So you're immediately connecting with an audience. You don't have to project to find them. They'll just come to, to you. And um, certainly when we've been putting things onto Google Street View, they, you were getting orders of magnitude greater hits there um, than on other social archive sites um, and social media, Facebook as well. Um, is good and we have set up a virtual museum framework which can be used as an archive to which you can upload stuff but um, we're to use as an example St Andrew's Preservation Trust of a virtual tour in um, of a virtual tour on round me so this shows it and this is an example of um, what I've done is um, uploaded all of the um, photo spheres that we've taken. So we've gone around with the camera. Um, actually, with these ones, we use an Insta3, Insta360 Pro. Um, but we've gone around to a number of places, taken 360 photographs, and uploaded those to um, Round Me. And that's very simple. It's just a question of dropping them on um, and then having uploaded them onto Round Me, gone in. And just, you see at the bottom, you can see the different photo spheres that are part of the tour. Um, just written a title, um, a title in there. Having done that, we can then use um, the Round Me infrastructure to add in interpretation. So in this case, what we're doing is, is just adding in a title, adding in a description, so, and putting in portals so that you can jump from place, from place to place. Um, so we planned that when we were planning our virtual tour. Now we've got the photo spheres, we can upload them to Round Me, and then within Round Me, um, just simply type in title and description. Um, but also we can upload photographs um, and we can upload videos if we want. So we can do quite a lot. And so we can then use the 360 image that we've made um, as a portal into different media and different um, interpretation. In that way, create a virtual museum experience or in that way create a virtual tour of a archaeological site or a landscape um, or whatever. Um, so this then shows us we, we, we can have a, a start page, this is where people go to start the virtual tour. Um, this is what they see with the um, pieces of interpretation here that we can, uh, that we can click on um, and here's in this case we've just put in text um, but you can see it's highlighting different aspects of the garden, helping to bring that to life. And this, by the way, is accessible over the web and it's also accessible on mobile devices and mobile phones. But also quite nicely, it connects in. So we can connect it to um, social media um, just by clicking on that. And what this does, it doesn't just connect to our social media. Um, anybody who goes to this site who, connect, who clicks on the um, share page, it connects to their social media. And so it's a good way, therefore, of um, tapping into the peer, peer networks that people have um, and in that way engaging and growing um, uh, an, an audience um, and awareness of the, of the heritage that is around. And this is just a slide showing what I've done, um, just uh, posted this to my uh, line um, and people have started Obviously, somebody like I just did this straight away, and somebody liked it, um, liked it straight away. So that was um, that was good. Um, so the second thing we can do, and we'll go through this in more detail, um, upload things on, onto um, Google Maps. So this is just showing the Preservation Trust on um, Google Maps. 
and then we have the photospheres that are part of that and so we click on um, the preservation trust we have a look at the 360 stuff and then we can go to this this um, place and we can um, uh, uh, get an all-round experience of it um, and then the third slide showing that what we can do is we can then share this to social media from Google Maps like Facebook and, and Twitter and so on and connect back connect back in again um, so one of the great things about using um, these platforms is, is that they're accessible they get people to see your, your product um, to, to see your to see your heritage so the third aspect is to develop an archive um, and here what we're wanting to do is to have a repository which will have the best possible um, photographs the highest resolution because when you're pushing to different social media to different outputs you may need to degrade the resolution in order to get access to that platform so if we have an archive then it gives us more flexibility um, in doing that and as part of cupido we've been developing um, such an archive so we can upload photospheres about the sites um, and we can then create our own maps this we can bypass Google Street View and this is open street maps um, and we have there there we have more flexibility in terms of the different sorts of media that we can use so we can use um, 3d media 3d galleries that's something we're going to be talking about um, on Tuesday so there's lots of opportunity there um, to, to, to develop um, different ways of approaching these media and different ways of looking at it so what about um, we've I think that there's a lot that we've tried to, to, to cover today um, and I think that um, each bit that we've talked about we could go into in more detail um, and what we're doing is we've got a like a, a Facebook group um, called uh, Heritage Studio that's going to be like a companion to the, this series and in that we're going to be posting um, YouTube videos and stuff that, that goes into a bit more detail of what we've covered. So the idea here is to, in a sense, to establish a roadmap to establish the issues. Um, but we recognise that there may be more that is required in order to take some of the steps to get the practice um, practice going. But the what about our other aspects? So one of the things is that 360 video is becoming big, um, and so we can move seamlessly from photospheres into working with 360 video in order to do that we need a specialist camera um, rather than the iPhone or the or the, or the uh, SL, SLR um, but there are platforms for it YouTube Vimeo and Facebook all take it um, and this is good for three things it's good for making flat videos so you get getting 360 footage and then choosing what orientation you want within that uh, to contribute towards a flat video so you capture a whole scene and then choose in post-production what you want um, making six fixed videos i.e you know having a camera on, on rocks and seeing the waves crashing around it um, or in a in a glen and seeing the um, the light and the movement in the trees um, but then also as an action camera which the insta 360 um, x is particularly good at um, so you know psych um, boating over rapids and that sort of thing. And then what about aerial? You can get stunning aerial 360s. We can do this, we need, they need to have a drone and need to have a spherical camera. Um, still, it's not huge amounts of, um, of money. Um, and we could just tie a spherical camera onto a drone and put it into the um, air. You need to be a little bit careful about um, it's flight and the weight, so you need to make sure that it's not a huge camera. It needs to be a really small camera. Um, and that's okay for taking a few images. Um, in wanting spherical video, um, we need to worry more about stabilization and so for that, and need um, bigger, um, bigger drones and um, again, more money. So, but that's interesting things to do. So, and sources and um, so th these are the people I, I've been speaking and Catherine's been speaking and we've been showing images um, and some of the work that we've been done. These are the people who have been involved in doing that work. So 
Bess Rhodes, Sarah Kennedy, Catherine Cassidy, Anne Cassidy, Alan Miller, that's me, um, CJ Davis, who is our expert on 360 um, images and imaging, um, Ian Oliver and Ishbel Duncan are the, are the team that we've been working with um, in and with Heritage. And as I say, if you go to Heritage Studio, that's a place where we're, we're, please hang about and ask questions and carry on the carry on the discussion. Um, we'll be really happy to develop any any themes. But uh, after the event, if you want to ask questions or ask us for resources, then if you go there, then and leave a message, then we will be happy to respond um, respond to that. So um, I think what we're going to do or thinking of doing was um, having a, a bit of a break now um, for 10 minutes and starting back at um, four. Um, and hopefully um, you'll want to do that um, and we can carry on the, and we can carry on the discussion. Um, the second half will be more free form. So if we've completely missed the um, boat in terms of what you are hoping for or what you're expecting, or that there's things that you wanted to find out that you feel you haven't found out, then the second half hopefully will address that, but also be more experiential based so that there will be people there from museums and community groups um, who you can ask about, um, you know, how, how does this technology work? Is it okay? And so on. So thank you very much. And I think I'll just hand over to um, James at this point. If, if I would be in, interested in, in if, if anybody wanted to like say who they, who they were and where they were from and, and, and if they had anything, uh, questions or, or not, just like what, what they're expecting from it. I'd also like to take the opportunity to introduce um, Jackie Aitken from the Time Span Museum, um, who's joining us from that, from the and she has some considerable experience with 360s and um, virtual tours and the like. And we were actually got a really exciting, probably got a really exciting announcement about um, uh, exhibition that is starting um, tomorrow um, online. Perfect. I think um, if we, if Jackie, if you want to put that announcement out together uh, uh, just now, or uh, and when it comes to anyone wanting to introduce themselves, what we'll do is for the um, uh, attendees, uh, for the, the panelists, workshop panelists, um, we'll raise our hands and then that means that we all don't all talk at once. Nope, you need to unmute yourself, Jackie. Okay, sorry. Thank you. You're also listed as me, if you want to change your name. I think that was the link I sent you, or Alan sent you. <laughs> your name is not Catherine. But don't worry about that. We, we, are, we are all, we are all Catherine. We are all Catherine. Catherine. I'm very privileged to be you, Catherine. Thank you. You can change, to, no, don't change to Jackie. I'll be a Jackie. <laughs> so, um, can I get a screen share back then? Uh, yes, Alan, you should have. Uh, I've, I've got uh, it, Alan. Yeah. Oh, great, great. Thank you. So, uh, I just screen share. Yes. Share. Great. So, um, so in, in terms of examples of um, okay, what yes, you can see the right thing, can't you? Which is the You just have um, to make everybody the, the, yeah, you're good. You can see the you can see the web browser, so that's great. Um, and we'll just make that big. So th this is just an example of of some um, of some virtual tools um, made using 360 um, cameras um, um, so th this this is quite an interesting one because it's an example of um, a virtual tour of a place that you can't go down which is a Cornish mine in um, in Tindrum uh, and you can move around 
to some level of zooming. So this this was made with can go deeper. So that's an, an example of a virtual tour. Um, One of the things that we've, uh, let me go back in time a little bit, Torian, excuse me. Um, so this is kind of like a, a portfolio um, of uh, things that we've done. So if we just make this um, screen. Um, and so this is St. Salvator, excuse me. This is St. Salvator's um, chapel in St. In St. Andrews. Um, and it, it's it's a um, impressive place um, in any case, but th this is done at really quite a high resolution. So it's an illustration really of how kind of like zoomy you can you can get. So you can get in really quite close um, on this. Now, okay, the, the, quite a lot of love and care has gone into creating this by um, CJ. Um, Davis, but it shows sort of the, the level that you can um, get. And another one that's really quite high resolution is this is the Bell Patrick Pettigrew Museum in St Andrews. Excuse me, using some examples from um, from St Andrews, but they are very set. And again, it gives you an idea of the sort of resolution that you can get if you take lots of um, photographs. And I don't know, I, I cover electrocardiograph models 1314 used in physiology so that's something that um, um, you can zoom in quite quite nicely on that um, so this this is Falkland Palace and again some nice kind of like 360 things so that's um that's 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 great but then Ooh, ooh. So that, that, that's kind of examples on the Roundme platform, um, mainly visuals rather than the interactive. So but I think that there's um, a lot of scope for doing the interactive. So if I just, just then go to Google um, Maps. Um, um, and so we put a lot of stuff onto Google Maps, a lot of 360s onto um, Google Maps. Um, and I just see who I'm... You know, so this is from the um, Cupido um, project. So we can just go and have a look at some of the contributions. Cupido project, um, we haven't done that much in terms of the photogrammetry, but the uh, uh, photo series, but there is some. Um, so this, this, this is an interesting example. So this is St Kilda. Um, again, somewhere where you can't, well, you can go, but it's not easy to, in the, even in the best of times, it's not easy to, um, to get there, um, and um, yeah, so you, this has been up a couple of months, I think, and you, so you see here this image here from St Kilda, um, 3,167 views, and this is actually doing quite well. I think it, in the last 24 hours, it's got, it had something like 500 new views um, on it, um, and that, that was actually shot with, as a video with a bunch of um, um, GoPros. Um, and th this is an example of, so what we've done here is we've, we've made, um, uh, we've made a uh, digital reconstruction of um, St Kilda as it would have been in um, about 18, um, 1890. And th this is in a game engine, it's in Unreal. Um, you can download it and you can play it, but by putting it, by creating photospheres from it and putting it onto Google Maps, it makes it immediately accessible. So, I mean, we can, they're, they're not, every, not all the images have done some well, and it can be a bit weird sometimes, um, which ones do well and which ones don't. But so this one here has had 935 views. That's not actually a photosphere, it's just, a, a, it's just a, a, an image. Um, Yeah. So there's, there's a whole range of different, um, so we can go here and we can have a look around. Um, and so you don't need to have a kick-ass PC graphics card and all of that thing, all of that stuff in order to 
do this virtual time travel stuff. Um, if we if we make a three D model, then we can put we can make some three sixty images um, of it. I'm good, just going to change because um, some of this stuff has been a bit um, specialist in the sense that um, um, you know you need in order to get a reconstruction on you need to um, make them make the model and stuff like that. And we will actually talk about that more in an in another. Um, sorry, in another session um, on, on virtual reality. Um, no. I seem to have locked myself into Cupid. I'm not quite sure why that is. Uh, it's up at the top. No, Alan, on the right-hand side. Oh, there it is. Well, yeah. I'm sure it wasn't there a minute ago when I looked at it. Uh, okay, so there we go. That's great. Thank you very much. Gotcha. Um, and I'll just look at another project, which has been going a bit longer. Um, and this is um, the EU LAC project, and we can go to the contributions there. Um, and the, the thing with this, is, well, one of the things to understand with this is that um, this also feeds into um, Street View. So if you upload something to Street View, um, it goes on Google Maps. And some of the things that you upload onto Google Maps um, go onto um, Street View. So this is um, museums, um, the ULAC. So you can see there, there's a quarter of a million views on the stuff that we've done um, as, part of this, as part of this account, which isn't mega, mega. Our main account, OBW, has close to one and a half million views. Um, on it. Um, these are actually interesting because this will refer to a bit to what we're doing next week. So one of the things that we've done here is to have 3D artifacts as part of um, as part of what we're doing. Um, so I know what I'm looking for, but whether I can find it or not is another question. Uh, Ike Museum. So part of the point about this is the, these, a lot of these photographs weren't done by um, a, an expert or a particularly skilled um, person, more of a sort of artisan um, type. And I can say that without fear of um, contradiction or causing offence because it was me that took them. Um, uh, and uh, here we go. Nearly to the one that I want. So I'm, I'm quite proud of this because this is this is in Seychelles, in um, Portugal, just south of um, just south of Lisbon. Um, um, where we visited to do um, workshops um, similar to similar to these, um, and yes, this one. I'm proud of because this 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 photosphere and I don't really know why, um, but it's got twenty five thousand hits on it, which I, I think I think it's quite it's a brick wall. It's quite an interesting brick wall. It was part of a it was, was it the cork factory or the armaments factory? Uh, this is a cork factory. Yeah, so it's part of a part of a cork factory, um, and I it took some other similar so. Uh, Google has an al has algorithms for deciding which photos it puts in front of people and which photos it doesn't. Um, so sometimes it's a good idea to take several photos and upload them and upload them to different um, to different places. But yeah, this is something that I took w with the camera that um, Catherine was talking about the in, in the um, Rico Theta camera, which at the time cost um, two two or three hundred pounds, and it's a nice photograph, but, but 25,000 people have looked at it, um, which must go some way towards promoting the, um, promoting the site. So, um, Tiny, you, are, you asked for a few questions, for, for a few examples. I've given some there. Um, I, I think that there's, there's a lot else that I could do, um, that I could show you, but um, I would like to pause, really, um, to give people an opportunity to stick up their hand or, or ask, ask further questions. Or, or maybe... Um, 
maybe some of you know a lot more than we do about 360 or, or whatever and, and want to make some suggestions or something. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, I'm just interested to see the ex any examples that have been populated by presenters. Typically, for us, we're at Hospitalfield House. It's a historic house, and it's uh, normal tours are are reliant on knowledgeable guides, and um, and that adds quite a bit to the people's enjoyment of the experience. And so, uh, are there any examples where there has been uh, kind of a spoken accompaniment to some of these tours and um, rather than um, yeah, any examples like that? Uh, yes. I was just uh, thinking, Alan, that was relevant to some of the events we've just been holding. I was okay. going to say that too. Time span. Oh, um, boy, Jackie. Yeah. So it's just when you said that, um, so we've been working, um, it's been a great collaboration between Timespan uh, and St Andrews and the, the open, uh, the, 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 the open, the, the virtual team there. And it's been great, but um, just as an example, we, um, so we've been working on uh, virtual world models um, and we've actually been working, um, or, or we were introduced to working with photospheres way back in about, well, about 2014, 2015. Um, I'll say maybe a little bit more about that. But um, we have a castle at Helmsdale. So one of our models uh, is a reconstruction of the village, the fishing village of Helmsdale. It's part of uh, my, ourselves, Timespan, and the St Andrews uh, team are part of this a project, the CNA project, uh, see, see, um, see the past, imagine the future. So as part of that, we've been making these virtual models and in the Helmsdill model, there is a castle that we've reconstructed through archeological archival uh, information. Uh, it's a research model, um, but it's great that we've been able, the, the castle was knocked down. I think maybe Alan might be able to get it up, I'm not sure. And so it's uh, had a little bit of controversial about it because it was interesting that the ca well the castle was knocked down in 1917 to make way for a new road bridge. It's also a very historical castle, uh, um, and there's lots of stories connected with it. And one of them about a, a triple murder, the triple poisoning that allegedly um, inspired Shakespeare to, to write Hamlet. So it's got all these different narratives, coastal erosion as well. It was undermined by uh, um, tides and, 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 and coming in and undermining the castle. So many interesting topics to discuss. And I absolutely think you're right. It's really important that there's somebody there um, or there are a few people to discuss and give a tour of the site. And this is what we did for the castle, um, uh, the example of the castle as part of the Heritage at Home um, events programme. And so I was able to tell people as we looked around the castle and explain all the different architectural details of the castle, explaining when it was built, who built it, but also go into some of the issues and debates around things like um, archaeological leg legislation and also about coastal erosion and quite a lot of important issues uh, locally as well. So um, yeah, these tours are really, I really think that digital um, photospheres work very well in terms of giving a real-time narrative and also it allows you to stop and explore specific features and actually really um, it, it, and also you, at the end of that you're able to take questions from the audiences as well. So we found it a very interactive, a very immediate response to something um, that, that had been created. Thanks a lot for that. Um, Jackie, uh, and um, there's, we're, we're going to be talking about live tours kind of like exclusively um, in, in a session um, the, the week after next. Um, but I, I think the, that um, it's also really um, not that hard to embed um, audio in this sort in this sort of um, environment in the uh, using um, using Roundly. So 
th this has got, I think this has got some audio that's that's there. But what, what I can show you, so I click on the top right here um, to, to put it into edit mode. Um, yeah, so I can now um, create um, a hotspot for audio by dragging that onto there. And I just drag and drop an audio file um, onto that. Um, and then when somebody comes to the photosphere, they can um, click on that to, um, to get the commentary. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to cancel it because I'm not going to, um, but oh, I'm not sure what, I think that these are actually background sounds. Um, that um, isn't there to lick on. It's a, it's a directional sound that is um, brought up inside of the uh, inside of the environment. Um, but there's uh, but there's other ones. Um, and th the other thing that we we've, we've looked at and we we're, we're doing and we, we is to, um, in a sense, use these um, three hundred and sixty images um, to create mini movies with. Um, so that you can send the image on a spin um, and um, screen capture that and in the process of screen capturing that put two, two or three together to create um, a tour which is um, which is linear um, and then that's easy to put audio put an audio commentary over the top of so that you can like take people on a specific route um, rather than leaving them free to choose um, where it is that they're wanting to go. So, yeah. Oh, we have a few hands. The hands? Yeah, so they're actual hands, yes. So if, if you want to just unmute yourself, there's also the, the raise hand feature, but yeah, you can ask a question. Go for it. Anybody who's... Hello. 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 Hi. hi, Alan. I met you on Isle Martin. Oh, hi. How are you doing? Hi. I'm good. I've had a real problem with technology, so I've missed a lot of what you've said. Um, oh, I was I'm wondering... sorry. Yeah, no. I just, my Isle Martin laptop seems to have slightly died, which is a bit sad. But anyway, luckily I had another one in the room. Um, I'm just wondering if there's something that you can share with us that is really simple. And maybe you have, and I've just missed it because I was faffing about. I could, I could hear you, but I couldn't see you. Something okay. that's really simple that somebody's done just using a camera and. Yeah, sure. Um... Well, this one that you're on specifically, Alan, was done by as part of a workshop and was done by workshop participants. Um, it was, I think there's a mix of photos in here that were both done by uh, an instant camera and by, uh, by smartphones. Um, but then they went through as part of, uh, part of that workshop of actually, you know, once the lecturer has a bit of learning to go through and then order everything, put it all in, add some text, some context, some narrative, some images. I don't think there's any audio in this. Uh, I'm not so sure. But as, as in a project in a time they sat down for probably, or from start to finish, maybe an hour of plotting what they were going to do as kind of a group uh, project during the workshop. What are we going to do? We're going to do this tour of the exhibit. We're going to go from here to here. We'll start outside. We'll go to here to here to here. This is how it'll go. And go and shoot it, take the photos off, put it into round me, and then start to order and to layer the media. Um, so just happened to be on this one, but I could tell you on this one, cause I was there, it would probably would have been work for about an hour, maybe an hour and a half. Um, and just with people who had just learned to do it. So uh, as a platform to order those tours, and I don't know if it was said uh, enough, but uh, these can obviously link back to Facebook, but these also link and can, or can embed into your website. So if you want to put it onto your website's page, as opposed to just social media platforms, uh, they offer embedding. Easy. Copy so, the code and put it right in. Sorry. So could, could these things be up from round me 
Um, mm -hmm. It's not something that I'm I'm familiar with. Um, could what you made on Round Me be then put into YouTube to be a YouTube video, which then could be put on your website? So what you could do with your Round Me tour is uh, usually through either your computer already has it, or maybe you have to download something of a screen grab uh, software. You can screen grab yourself going in. Alan had just mentioned that about creating a tour off of, you know, spinning and maybe you saying, I want to go and take people this way and this way, and then do a full audio commentary on top of it. And then you can create that as a video and you can do that. And then all of a sudden that's another bit of media that you can then use and you can put it on YouTube. Um, but it's because it's interactive. I'm not sure if, can it link up to round? I don't think it can link up to YouTube. I'm not sure, Alan, if you can correct me on this, if you know, but. Yeah, so I think what you're saying is, is right, is, is that, um, um, so 360s and um, social media um, and Facebook. So one is that you, you can actually upload this um, 360 image um, or take a 360 video with, with a camera, you can upload that directly to um, Facebook. Um, and doing that has some advantages because Facebook um, prioritizes um, stuff that has been uploaded to it directly rather than linked, rather than linked to it. So these, these images now could, could be uploaded directly to Facebook and therefore then sit in a um, an album or a gallery on Facebook um, or be put onto the um, news feeds um, and shared in that way. Um, so then the second thing is that um, you, you can very easily share this with onto Facebook um, so that there's a button that you, I, I, just to say that the, the application is behaving a little bit strangely and I think that that is because it is being screen shared. So I'm not seeing all of the controls that would normally, um, that I would normally see. But up here in the top right hand corner, there would normally be a button that you can press um, that will put you into edit or out of edit mode. Um, uh, and that you can click on that and it will then enable you to share. It's on the, in the PowerPoints that, um, that, that yeah, it's in, it's in the PowerPoints as well. So, um, so you can just click on that and then click on share to Facebook and it will share, share you to, it will share to Facebook with no problem at all. And then the third thing that you can do is you, as Catherine said, you can put this onto a spin um, and then use a screen capture um, facility. Um, OBS is, is an example of a screen capture facility, but use something to capture the screen that turns it into a video and then you can then work with that um, as, it, as it was a video, um, add a audio track over the top of it or something like that. So that's three ways that you can get these sorts of things into social media. So once you've got a 360 image, um, you've got quite a valuable resource that you can then use in different ways. Um, yeah, and, and yeah, I, I took some of these and these were part of a workshop. So, um, and, we put something like a thousand images up onto 360 images up onto Google um, Google Maps, and I have to say that some of the ones that were taken by an expert that were love you know done really lovingly and spent a lot of time on got a lot of hits, but also some of the ones that um, someone just rocked up with a camera stuck it stuck it there and went click and walked away again got a huge number of clicks, um, you know, as, as well. I think it's the same sort of adage is with for photography in general, you know, the, the best camera in the world is the one that you've got in your pocket because that's the one you can take a photograph, um, you can take a photograph with. So I think the thing to do is to be brave and to take, try, try to, you know, take a photograph and then once one's been taken, take another one and, and, and use them and, and chuck, chuck them out there. I noticed there's four hands up, so. Um, does someone want to? Catty. Catty first. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, I'm from Stromness Museum up in Orkney. Um, and one of my questions was about Sketchfab models and whether you can make them 
into hot spots. So you could have, um, you know, a museum 360 and then someone could clip on an artifact and manipulate it in Sketchfab. That's a great question. Um, it's really annoying because actually you can, but only while you're editing it. And as soon as you close down the edit, it stops working. So uh, some, some, at least the last time that I tried. So what we've done to kind of get around that is, is to take the Sketchfab models, take photographs of them or take videos of them and they can be embedded um, directly. Um, with round me and the other thing is Catherine we, you, you've done quite a lot of embedding um, sketch bad models in 360 mm -hmm. environments but outside of round me yeah actually putting well not adding them actually integrating them and putting them back into uh, like the actual media of a photosphere or a, or into a um, back into the digital environment so it's kind of moving it, you know, is it within it? Is it kind of on top of, or is it back into the context again? So, uh, yeah, I don't, I haven't actually tried to do it in a bit. So I don't know if it, there's an issue still with it right now, but you can, because I think you can see on Alan's screen right now um, that it says 3D. Um, kind of oh, cleared yeah. up. Uh, but I think yeah, that's, that's more, that's, 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 that's stereo. stereo. Yeah, that's stereo. Um, but what I've done, uh, because we've realized, uh, kind of research, especially with what's going on right now with a lot of people interacting with things online, is that when you go onto Sketchfab in a model that's more active uh, engagement that some people may not know how to do or want to do, but with a video of it, spinning around moving around that's passive and you can still get an experience out of it so we've been able to do a lot with both and still get a lot uh, of reach with both so putting the 3d on as a video sometimes can be a little bit more um, the reach can be a little bit broader uh, mm -hmm. with where you can then put it and embed it because then it's just a video file as opposed to the 3d file but you that being said you can still do so much with 3D um, well, Sketchfab models as well and embedding that. And we're, uh, that's my uh, my talk on Tuesday, but plug. Okay. <laughs> the other question I had was, um, I kind of want, I want someone to um, tell me that this wouldn't happen, but do you think that visitors, when they are able to go back to polices, would be less inclined to go because they'd already seen it virtually? So um, I kind of think it as when you're going on vacation and you're kind of looking at places to go, but you haven't been there before and you're kind of like, mm, let me scope it out. Um, you go and you might look at video, you might look at photos, you might look at blogs, you might even go on Google Maps and look at some 360s. I don't think, I know in my experience and I know with a lot of people's experience, that has not hindered them to going because you're still, there's a different um, experience with the real versus the unreal or versus the virtual. So it just makes you a more informed visitor. Um, you know, and if it is something where, if you, every time you see a photo of something and you're like, well, I've seen it, that's it, I'm good. Okay, that's fine, that's you. But I highly doubt uh, that's a majority of the population. You know, like I have seen, photos of you know the pyramids a bazillion times but you know get the chance i would go and see them in person so i don't think it's um i don't think it's a hindrance i think it's an avenue for people to step into your museum and be more informed and educated and then an educated visitor uh to going in you know because they've seen it in a different kind of lens online okay that's good that's what i wanted to hear and yeah. I was it's more oh, the case in, in the time span as well with what they've been doing. Have they seen visitors come in because they've seen things online? Um, you can answer that. Yeah, I mean, it's a very good question. And um, in, in the beginning, when we kind of went on this digital journey, 
um, looking at our collection, um, how to give it a broader reach, and also that um, we also realised that you know museums are, are our audiences are changing, um, and in terms of what they kind of expect, and also. Um, the types of way that they would they want to interact with um, our exhibits, our collections, and I'm sure we're not the only uh, museum that will say there is a probably quite a, a big part of other museums collections that don't always get um, displayed. You know, you only can put a certain number of objects um, and stories in your museum at any one time, um, and also. I think it's it's really freed us and opened us up to other possibilities of adding to our collections through um, loans from other museums, possibly the National Museum, in terms of the potential for loaning into our collection. So if there was an object that we thought, like the Helmsdale Hoard, <laughs> that is in the National Museum, and there's a possibility of actually, um, you know, you know, um, getting some sort of 3D um, video of it in terms of what we can display uh, a photosphere film of it, then that would really add to uh, the story and narrative of what we can tell people. But in terms of the engagement with our museum by visitors, um, we were a little bit concerned at the beginning exactly what you had said, that there would be less um, people coming through our doors to actually see the um, exhibits that we, we had. And it really is not the case. In fact, I, I would say it, it, it has actually added to our, uh, it has added to the tools that we have available to us to engage with and increase our, our audiences that we have. In fact, we have a much more global audience. We are quite a local museum, but we, we, we face globally. So we are very you know, we, we want to engage with a much wider audience and this has certainly given us the ability to do that. And also, it, 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 it is one layer of interpretation. It, it's a, once you've actually worked with 3D digital objects and, and in your collection, you actually begin to, to really see that it, it's another way of looking at an object and it is another narrative. It's not like looking at an object in real life. It, it's, it's got a different story to tell. And then when you actually go in, it actually encourages you to go into the museum and actually find the other way of, of interacting with an object as well. And it's not very likely at the moment that most museums will have every single object um, shown in a digital format, in a digital way. It's more up to the museum to, to, to select what, what they will uh, that what they will show and why they show that particular object. So I think it's about the selection process and also about um, it gives you more tools to engage with audiences. That's great. Thank you very much. Really helpful. Um, and I'm aware too because we also we have Jackie, but we also have Skoda on. And I don't know if you wanted to say anything, Skoda, from uh, Skoda Cluster in East Iceland. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I just want to jump on that a little bit because also, yes, it makes it so much easier to explain quite a lot of things to people when you have both the virtual tours and the technology that we have. So instead of spending a half an hour just to explain layer of the building, I can show my visitor the layer of the building. Then we can talk about why it was important to have it that way. So it doesn't take from each other. It just helps. It completely helps each other. But I, I just wanted to jump on that. <laughs> oh, good. Well, because you. you both have kind of similar, uh, well, when before lockdown, your audiences um, could be a lot of uh, tourism, as well, of, of coming in and coach tours and different things as well. But then also, you're also trying, you know, the local area as well and nationally. Um, so you're getting yeah. a very diverse audience. And I think it's also important not just to see your audience as the visitors that come into your museum. There, you know, it is, it is a huge audience that's out there. Some of them may not directly engage with your museum by coming in, but there's a huge other potential to engage with your museum out with the walls and, and, and also to, to engage 
for example, Timespan is very um, proactive at being quite a museum where it acts on really important issues that are happening like climate change, sustainable living. Um, and we're able to do this because we've got such a far reach. So I think it's really important to reach out and then the benefits do come back to you. It's a great platform for discussion and debate. Um, and there, you know, there's lots of potential in, in that way. So it's, it's very versatile. Thank you. Do we have more questions? I think we did. Yeah, I think we have uh, Shauna <laughs> as well. <laughs> oh, and I see Elizabeth too. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hi there. Yeah, Hi. Um, I was just going to say, I'm uh, working for the Museum of Neil in the Western Isles and uh, working on a particular project for Year of Coasts and Waters. And obviously, um, I had to make all the content for the project online. Um, so this was going to be a kind of a way in for me to, because I've been doing videos using photographs and small sections of video um, and kind of stitching them together in iMovie on my iPhone and then uploading them onto YouTube and onto social media. Um, so yeah, it was kind of, uh, it's interesting to see how the 3D and the kind of 360 kind of, I could do it. I'm wanting to learn how to do it with the phone and right. I've now got a GoPro. <laughs> so oh, I was just, it was good, good to kind of see how that would fit in with what I'm doing here mm -hmm. uh, for the museum as well. Well, and, and with anything too, with anything that's new, it's just trying it and getting better. And the more times that you do it, getting better and better and realizing, you know, your mistakes as you go. Um, and then building on from that. So it's just really, especially if you already have, you know, we're all sitting at home pretty much right now. So if you, you know, you just look and see what's available right now for you. Um, just looking on, you know, if you have a smartphone and seeing what's free uh, and just starting with that, you know, whether it's just at home, you know, just doing, oh, I'm gonna make a photo of in my living room, you know, but as practice, it's just going and just starting to do and then you start to become more comfortable with it and realizing how, how it works and integrates. Yeah, because so I'm interested in doing the, the audio tours as part of it, mm -hmm. because obviously uh, part of the project is doing it, some of it in Gaelic and being able to be right. bilingual with the, the material. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, excited to see what you do. <laughs> I'm going to give it a go anyway. <laughs> we'll see Good on you. <laughs> cool. Uh, Elizabeth, did you have a, you had a question? Well, I'm looking at all these. I'm Elizabeth and I'm in Oban and um, I'm with the Rockfield Heritage Center. It's the, the Rockfield School that's being renovated into a cultural center and heritage site. And um, so while I've been home, I've only just started with the job and I um, have wanted to put together a walking tour, a virtual walking tour for children um, that they can interact with um, built heritage around Oban and we can acknowledge we can still function we can do all this and with social distancing and so I I'm learning so much right now because I felt like it was beyond me to do this <laughs> but and so I have very minimal technology so I have I don't have fancy cameras I have an iPhone <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and the round me, this is all, is this, and it is free. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that, go ahead. Go, go, go. And do I need, in order to do these 360 type of images and photos and collections that, do I really need one of those bigger cameras or one of those fancier, more um, expensive pieces of equipment? Well, I think on your first thing, um, which I think Alan was going to say, so but and Alan, if you want to say anything, but the uh, Rami is free and just like everything else up to a point, you know, but you still have uh, a lot that is available to you in a free, in the free uh, package, as it were. Yeah. Um, I think, I think with anything and just like I said to Shona, it's just start using it because if you start using it and you realize it's perfect for you, great. Awesome. Um, what the 
cameras, the more expensive cameras, uh, like those instant ones, what those provide is just um, like just being quick, just being able to set it up, doing it quickly, pressing a button, putting your you know different kind of levels in if you want, or just keeping it all auto. It offers just that flexibility of just, hey, I've got it on the tripod, I'm gonna stick it and hide it around a corner. When it's you on your phone, you can certainly still make it, but it's just a little bit more time. And like I said about like, just takes a bit more practice, minutes. a bit more thought. Yeah, but it's a great, um, especially if you're doing it, um, you know, you're social distancing, you're doing it for kids. Um, it's, it's just getting the content first, you know? And so whatever way you do that, as then you just need to, to have the content because then all of a sudden you can do so much more with it. So it's kind of, if that, like Alan said, that that's the most, that's the best camera because you have it. You have it in your, in your hand. And um, we will, even with our um, different array of choices that we have personally in the research group, sometimes we resort back because with uh, one of those instant cameras that even though we have the nice big one or we have, you know, can take the time and do a, a multi um, photo one with a DSLR camera, sometimes it's like, hey, we have 20 minutes and, mm -hmm. you know, let's we're on the go or we've hiked somewhere or we done and we're not taking the big you know insta 360 which kind of looks like a, an alien um you know it's all about the situation too so it's just it's getting it using it being familiar and comfortable with it seeing if it works for you and and situation too so i definitely not saying that you need to have any of that um and that's why we're giving kind of that option and laying out the pros and cons and what they can the capacity of all of them as well so i okay. think same thing that i said to shona just you know, like start doing it and give it a go and then there's lots of um we're gonna have a lot of um different things on that uh, facebook group too for like tutorials and kind of helpful things as well documents but also even just the internet okay well i'll just I'm working with our heritage group to actually create the narrative, the story for it right now. And um, once I have that, then I'll go out and actually get my, I'll know what I want. I'll yes. know what images I need and I can go get those and then I'll play and start getting it together. That was mm -hmm. the other thing is that we have a, we have a lovely archive of audio recordings from various people. And I think that I'll be able to get that in as well. Mm -hmm. And like I'm so it's very exciting to learn about this. <laughs> great. That's what I needed. <laughs> That's great. Best That's feedback great. ever. And and just to kind of say, we we started in 2015 with a project called 58 Degrees North, and and I'd never made a photosphere before. So um, linking up with uh, uh, the team at St Andrews, it it the first time I think, and I just had an iPhone as well, so. Um, it was an app, uh, so we downloaded an app to the phone, um, and then the first time I, I made a photosphere, as Catherine had said, you just have to try it, you know, it's uh, just go out there and, and make a photosphere, so at time span we did that, and I have to say, my first attempt probably wasn't that great, but I, it's quite intuitive, to, to do it but once you actually get all the photos together and then you see it processed it it's kind of yes it, it's a it's, it's really it's a great moment when it all comes together and I actually think it only took about two or three times before I actually got the hang of it I, I didn't find it that difficult um, and, and found it you know really worked really well and then actually putting it up you know loading it up to around me um, was a great way of uh, sharing it with everybody else and we actually, through that project, offered training to other groups um, in Sutherland as well. So we went out and we just said, what phones have you got? So um, uh, St Andrews and my, uh, a member of the St Andrews team and myself would go over. And I suppose I was the amateur and we had uh, maybe Sarah from St Andrews. And we went over, remember, we went over to Loch Inver and we met a heritage group there. And we just went out to the harbour at Loch Inver or we went up to... Um, uh, the, you know, sort of the hillscapes as well. Some of the hills are spectacular there. And um, these were people that had never made photospheres before. So we were there 
as it was said, I think half an hour to an hour. And within that time, we were seeing some really good photospheres being produced of amazing landscapes and places that were important to people that they wanted to, to take photospheres off. So yeah, I think it's absolutely right. Go out and have a go. And it is great fun to do as well. That's great. That's great. But um, do, 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 yeah, the Google Street View app is um, used by a lot of people. I'm just wondering, have, have any of you guys got it on, on your phones? Few nods, few no nods. Some, some, can you vote? <laughs> <laughs> just, so, so I, I think that's the first step is to stick it on, stick it on the phone. The instructions are quite good. Yeah. I think it kind of steps you through it step by step. Um, I, th I think the top tip is like the, the normal thing that you would do with a phone when you're, make, when you're shooting a panorama is to kind of do it like this. Oh, can you see? Do it like this. Right? So the, when the, the thing that you want to do is... Um, you see the lens is here. You want to keep that lens in the same place. So you'll be asked to take a bunch of photographs, but the idea is to try and keep the lens in the same place. And, and then that will mean that everything can stitch up properly together. And one way to do that, I think we did it in Helmsdale Harbour, is to have like a broomstick or something like that. So you've got a broomstick and just put the phone on the top of the broomstick and just keep them in contact with each other. And the broomstick doesn't move then the phone's staying in the same, in the same place. And go through and do that. You I'm not, to try upon. I'm not very good at, yeah, I'm not very good at doing this, but, but Catherine, you are, aren't you? So we have a team. I've just seen you've done some, I've done, done some good, um, good some, some good things yeah. on that. So, um, yeah. But also I think, you know, we, we've focused a lot on 360 um, images, but hey, there's nothing wrong with a virtual tour being, um, a sequence of normal photographs with some comment with some commentary, and that sequence can be in a gallery, or you could just lay them down on something like um, on the video system that comes with um, uh, you know your your Apple or your or your Windows desktop, and just put put an image, and then another image, and then another image, and then another image on the timeline of the video, um, and create an audio track. So you can create an audio track very easily with the phone, um, selecting and selecting an audio. And there's a great bit of software called Audacity, which is free that you can use to um, cut the audio up into, into the pieces that you want it and to rearrange it and do noise cancellation and things like that. So really a mobile phone um, and some Audacity will get you the audio track together. Um, and then you just put the audio track onto the video um, and you've got a sort of nice virtual tour to, to upload. Um, and you could do the same thing with the 360 um, images, putting them on spin and, and doing, doing screen capture stuff. So I think that there's um, a lot. And what, I guess one of the things that we're hoping that will come out of these workshops is we'll develop a bit of community, you know, because I think that at, at the end of the day, um, none of these things are particularly difficult once you know how to do them, right? But that, that's always the, it, it's always the case. Um, and what we're hoping to do is just give a bit of confidence um, and a place where people can ask, can I, where people can ask questions and also to try to explain what in our view is, is possible in terms of kind of, you know, provide some sort of roadmap for people to for people to do these things but, but I, th I think it's a lot of the themes that have been raised today we'll return to next week and in future weeks as well sorry so perfect um do we have how any are we doing? i think we've both got four minutes left by the clock so we have any any more for any more at all or Anyone want to get? I, I was just going to say that that's 
that's what I was trying to get at when I asked my question. You know, I, I'm working for, for a trust that own a community owned island and I don't actually drive a boat and we're not really meant to be doing these things. This is, or I haven't, I haven't heard Nicola Sturgeon. Did anyone hear it? Missed it. Um, but you know, that's that I have lots of photographs and I'm just thinking, could I do something with what I already have? Mm -hmm. I can make my laptop talk ever again. Um, you know, and that's, that's, so that's answered my question. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I think that we've been thinking about, so, so the first thing is what can, what can be done with, what exists, you know, what, what you have, and, and, and a lot can be, and a lot can be done, and we're happy to, 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 to help with, with that. Um, but there will be a point in time where um, it's okay to go out and make 360 photographs in places, if you live there, you know, um, or in your museum if you work there, but that point in time will probably be considerably before you, you can expect for lots of people to um, you know the, the the normal sort of tourist traffic to 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 resume. So in that space, I think I think three hundred and sixty images and virtual tours are valuable at any point in time. But at that point in time, they're, they're particularly valuable. So I think we that, that's what we're hoping that we can encourage those sorts of activities. But but very clearly um, within the um, restrictions that that exist, because we're talking about trying to promote heritage within the context of best practice for healthy living and, and people's health. So we wouldn't want anyone to take from this that, you know, okay, jump in the car, drive to the Highlands and start making 360, um, 360 stuff. I think that the, the, the health advice that we have is something that we should really um, follow. Well, as long as, yes, we should follow. Unlike some people. Don't go to Durham. Sorry? <laughs> Durham. <laughs> try inside first as well. That's what we did. Just try inside in the room you're in. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Especially for practice, yeah. That's true. Or, or the garden. I mean, I would say that, yeah, do try inside. Um, but also, also outside, yeah. Yeah, because... Yeah, it can be a little bit harder getting things to line up straight when you're inside, but, but, but yeah. So that's great. I'm really pleased that you all came. I, I thought that, you know, it would be me, me, Catherine and James talking to, talking to each other. I'm, it's really glad to see that um, there is interest. And also I, I'm, it's really nice um, group of questions that, that you've been um, asking us, um, and I hope that we've gone some way to answering those. But we will we will think about the questions that you asked us and see how we can help in in future. And feel free to get in touch um, with us, um, James. I don't mind my email going out to any of the participants if if, if they want that. Yeah, we can we can share your, your details across, and also as, as we put um, the events onto our website as well as our social media channels so we can uh, pop contact details on there as well for anyone who'd like to to get in touch afterwards as well and again if you are participating in one of the next workshops coming up the next one being next tuesday by which time it will be june um we can even see if there's any uh, questions that have come through in advance that we'd we'd have to to put to put back with quick q a bits in a intermission then as well so cool we can update that yeah can i yeah. just something say that oh sorry can i'm I just serious quick, quickly say that to, to, <laughs> sorry T tomorrow night if people want to join us for more uh for for our time span has our our live uh, launch of our real rights exhibition where we'll be showing some of the wonderful work we've made with St Andrews for the Cine project so our uh, our new digital models um, immersive models our virtual world models so we hope it's at six o'clock and I believe that the link has been shared with uh, on, on this event. We can pop a wee, uh, an update to that as well for, for times for us as a reminder. Sorry. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Alan, I, I assume that this uh, workshop is recorded, so it's possible for the people who have missed this 
uh, workshop due to the difference in time that they can um, can look at that again yeah ab absolutely it's recorded and, and Tini, if, if there's if there's demand i don't i don't mind you know putting on a sideshow for for, um, for for you guys as well it would be nice so, for the people so in, in the netherlands that um we can uh, some people are interested they can review this um this workshop and that you also can include your examples yeah so maybe, well, then, maybe, yeah. We, maybe we can do like a fix a time and do a facebook watch party or something like that so we can play back the we can play back the video on facebook but um be there as well to for, for taking questions but does that would, would that work with us you think um james that... yeah we can do that that would be a bother to do at all um we can, we'll sort something out and um put an option together yeah yep thank you uh, very much because it's very interesting thank you. thank you uh edward i saw a finger hand <laughs> Uh, yeah, just um, from uh, a colleague of mine who is uh, who's in in the in the Facebook audience because she couldn't get into the into the room. It's oversubscribed. Just wondered um, whether you could even actually just rerun this whole seminar again. I think you've got, I think you've got a, an audience out there of other people who find. Yeah, oh, there that... you go. Demand yeah. is needed. Yeah. That's what we like to hear. <laughs> I, I, I don't. I don't mind doing that, but, but but we'll take it under advisement because I know the Expo North people are really really busy and they've they've got a whole program of um exciting events to come up with. But I think that yeah, if if if, if there's, uh, I mean we 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 can figure something out. Can we not? I think we can figure something yeah, out. Yeah, we, we have a, we have a lot of options that we can we can put together with this. And like we said before, it, this is you're know, being recorded as. Uh, as content as well so that it there will be options moving forward for anyone who missed out on on all of this today to to review afterwards as well um and quickly anyone here or listening um if you go on to the expo north event uh on the website or on facebook there's a survey uh which would be really great if we could do it um for anybody listening and in on this, uh, just informative and uh, for our research, just to kind of have an idea of what your situation was before um, or before the, the lockdown, what's happening now, uh, and then also your interest in this webinar uh, and specifically virtual tours and, uh, and a little bit of what you learned, but shouldn't take too long, but if you could, that'd be great. Can I just ask, are you going to share the, the presentations? I, I completely missed the visual presentations. Um, are, are they going to be shared with people that were here? Yeah, uh, sure. Yes. Uh, can, can I just ask why? What Was there something, it was, was it something no, at our end? Or? No, it wasn't, Alan. It was, it was my laptop. It just, I could hear you, but I couldn't see anything on my laptop. The screen has gone black. Oh. It's a bit of a worry. We got there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, James. That's all right. <laughs> uh, is, is, your is your screen fixed now? Or? No, this is my other laptop. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Might need to funding application. Um, well, you know, the um, Museums Gallery Scotland have do 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 are have got a current call for like COVID nineteen related um related equipment um, bids and put equipment to make virtual tours might be something that that they would consider. It would have to come from an accredited museum, but if, if, if anybody was in that situation, I'd be happy to have a conversation to give people a few pointers as to how they might be able to get some uh, investment um, in, in, ma in making virtual tours. Yeah, um, I got actually uh, funding from NGS for equipment for doing these sorts of things. That's how I was able to get the GoPro and the tripod. But um, I wish I had known about this, so I could have gone for the 360 cameras as well as part of it. Okay. Um, we have a few with the, um, with the Cupido project. 
So it might be possible to figure out a loan or something like that if you wanted to, if people wanted to borrow a camera for a while. That would be great. Yep. Yeah. Go ahead, Edwin. Where, where are you, Shana? Sorry, okay. Sorry, um, it's being on behalf of the Scottish um, Community Heritage Alliance. In point of fact, the requirement to be an accredited museum to access this funding has now been taken away for the duration of the COVID-19 um, crisis. So you don't need to be accredited in order to access that funding. Nice. Well, that's a great piece of information. Um, so, yeah, if, if, if you were thinking of doing that, then maybe the contents here would, would inform you. Um, but we, we would be, to I, I'd be happy to chat to anybody um, if, if they were putting in an application just to, um, if you had any questions that you thought I could help with. And we'll pop, we'll pop up your, your details onto the, the event as well for, for those to continue then, yeah. Uh, just to clarify, because this is the first one and we're going to be doing, you know, more of them. So we'll have it down pat after this, but the uh, presentation, because you were asking um, about where the presentation would be, what would be the best place to put it on as a document, maybe on the Facebook group? Um, there's a, a multitude of, of, of ways you can do that off the top of my head. We could pop that onto the Facebook group itself as well, but also uh, we can add um, onto the Expo North website, for example, we have a resources section uh, and we can effectively, as we go, create a single page, which creates a, almost like a curriculum of reference notes that way as well. Uh, and we can have an archive that way um, so that they can be it can be added to over time and then used at a future point for reference as well. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I think, I think that would work. We, we, so if we, do, if we do that and we'll, like the Facebook group will be, be kind of like for chat and we'll point, a, point in that direction and um, um, like we'll point in the direction container. of Expo North thing, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah so we'll, can I just ask what the Facebook group is called? I've missed that. Um, it is called what is it called Catherine it's called would you uh, will heritage add... studio heritage that's studio. what it is heritage studio you put me on the spot can <laughs> immediately wiped clean <laughs> and me, well, I don't I know. Know. so it's facebook groups heritage studio um yeah there's not a tremendous amount there but we're hoping it will grow as we go as we as we go along and it's certainly a place where you can you know ask questions and, and, and chat with each other um but the, the the yeah the expo north resources and the expo north page would be a great place to to look and that will be kind of more sort of formal and um more sort of formal yep perfectly yep we can do that. controlled thing that would be great um yeah great well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for for joining us, everyone. That's a, it's been a it's been a great evening. I've I've certainly learned an awful lot more as well uh, from just getting to tune in. So I'm really looking forward to the next um, the next seven uh, editions that we have of this, comprising of two parts. The next being on Tuesday, the second of June, uh, same time, same place, four p.m. Um, yeah, we look forward to to seeing you then. Okay. Thank you. That's great. Thank, Thank you, you for everyone coming.